Welcome to The Deep Dive, the show that gets straight to the heart of what matters. Today, we're taking a close look at some really essential knowledge for anyone involved in welding inspection, quality assurance, basically making sure things don't fall apart. Right. This isn't just theory. It's the bedrock stuff, the principles that ensure structural integrity, safety, you know, the kind of understanding that really makes a difference. And for those of you maybe prepping for exams, something like the CS WIP 3.1, well, think of this as helping you master those invisible details that make or break a weld. Okay, let's unpack this. Uh, absolutely. And what's really fascinating, I think, is how these fundamental ideas they seem abstract sometimes, right? Yeah. But they have huge practical effects on a project. Huge, yeah. We're not just talking about making a weld look good. We're talking about a sound, reliable connection. Understanding why we do things certain ways. Yeah. That's everything. Couldn't agree more. These little details, they can genuinely decide the fate of, well, massive structures. It's important stuff. Okay, so let's dive right in. Let's start with a really fundamental challenge. Some people call it the silent saboteur in welding. Mm, hydrogen. Exactly. Hydrogen. When we talk about weld metal, why is it so, so critical to keep hydrogen out? What are we fundamentally trying to prevent here? What's the big danger? Well, if you connect it all up, hydrogen. It's one of the biggest enemies in welding, really, because of its role in cold cracking. Cold cracking. Okay. And this isn't just, you know, a minor flaw. It can be catastrophic. It reminds you that even things you can't see, like hydrogen atoms, can cause major problems later on. Right. So the number one reason, uh, the absolute main concern for keeping hydrogen out is mm -hmm. preventing that cracking. Specifically things like hydrogen embrittlement, or sometimes it's called delayed hydrogen cracking. Delayed. That's the really tricky part, isn't it? It doesn't show up right away. Exactly. Can you explain that a bit more? How does hydrogen, these tiny little atoms, actually cause a weld to crack? Uh, yeah. It's about how mobile they are and how they react to stress. Hydrogen atoms, they're incredibly small. They dissolve into the molten weld pool easily. Mm. Then as the metal cools and solidifies, they can move around, diffuse through the steel pretty quickly. Okay. And they tend to gather in areas where there's high stress. Think microscopic flaws, maybe near inclusions, or in the heat-affected zone next to the weld. Over time, and this is the key at room temperature, these hydrogen atoms can actually combine inside tiny voids in the metal to form molecular hydrogen, H2 gas. Ah, so they build up pressure from the inside. Precisely. Immense internal pressure. Yeah. Now, you add that internal pressure to the residual stresses already in the weld from the cooling process. Which are always there. Always there. And you've got, well, a recipe for brittle fracture. It can just snap, often with no warning, no stretching or anything. Wow. And it might happen hours, days, even weeks after you finish welding. That's why it's called delayed and why it's so insidious. So it's not really about the cooling speed itself being affected by hydrogen, but cooling allows the hydrogen to get into position to cause the damage. That makes sense. It appearing long after the fact. Yeah. That really hits home why inspectors need to understand this. Okay, speaking of things you might find later, let's shift to an on-site scenario. Okay. Imagine you're out in the field looking at some finished metal arc welds and you notice severe porosity not just one or two spots, but like really widespread pores in the weld. Right. Bad news. Yeah. Red flag immediately. What's the very first thing you should investigate to figure out the cause? Where do you look first? Hmm. This really brings up a basic point about process control, doesn't it? Often it's the simple stuff, the things people overlook that cause the biggest problems. So what is it here? When you see severe porosity in arc wells, particularly if it's everywhere, mm -hmm. the absolute first thing to check is electrode storage. Electrode storage not the type of electrode or the welding machine itself. Well, those can play a role in other issues, sure. But for severe, widespread porosity in SMAW, metal arc welding, improper storage is almost always the prime suspect. Why is that? Because of moisture. Many welding electrode coatings are hygroscopic. That's just a fancy way of saying they soak up moisture from the air like a sponge if they're not kept dry. Okay, like in a heated oven or sealed packs. Exactly. If they get damp, when you strike the arc, the intense heat breaks down that moisture, the H2O. Right, water. And that releases hydrogen and oxygen straight into your molten weld pool. 
As the weld cools and solidifies, those gases try to bubble out. But if there's too much? If there's too much gas or it cools too quickly, they get trapped. Mm. And those trapped bubbles are what you see as porosity little holes or voids. I see. So you could have the best low hydrogen electrode in the world, mm. but if it's been left out in the rain or just in a damp site hut... It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The moisture negates the low hydrogen design. Mm -hmm. Power source problems usually show up differently, maybe arc instability, penetration issues, and ambient temperature. Yeah, well, it affects preheat maybe, but it doesn't directly cause gas bubbles like this. It's usually damp electrodes. That's incredible. Such a basic thing, keeping your rods dry, leading to such a major defect, really highlights that process control point. Definitely. Okay, let's pivot slightly from defects to prevention and maybe a more sensitive material. Let's talk TIG welding. Specifically, say, austenitic stainless steel pipe. Uh, okay, critical stuff. We always see specs calling for argon gas backing on these welds, you know, purging the inside of the pipe. What's the specific number one reason for doing that? What are we trying to achieve with that argon backing? Yeah, this is super important and goes right to the core of why we use stainless steel in the first place, usually for its corrosion resistance. Right. When you're TIG welding stainless steel, the primary absolutely crucial reason for using that argon gas backing is to prevent oxidation on the root side. Oxidation. So protecting the back of the weld from the air, not just the front where the torch is. Exactly that. Stainless steel gets its corrosion resistance from a thin, invisible layer of chromium oxide on the surface. It forms naturally. But when you heat the metal up really hot during welding, especially on the root side, inside the pipe where it's exposed to air, that protective mechanism gets disrupted. How so? Oxygen in the air reacts very readily with the hot stainless steel. It forms thicker, detrimental oxides. You often see it as a dark, sugary-looking scale on the inside of the weld bead, sometimes called sugaring. I've seen that. Not good. Not good at all. That oxidized layer completely compromises the corrosion resistance locally. It can also mess with mechanical properties and just looks terrible. So the argon. Argon is inert. It doesn't react. By flooding the inside of the pipe, the back of the weld, with argon, you push out the air, push out the oxygen. Creates a shield. Creates an inert shield. It protects the hot metal from reacting with the atmosphere while it cools down. This preserves the weld's integrity and, critically, its corrosion resistance. Uh, makes sense. Now, sure, backing gas might help a tiny bit with bead shape, maybe prevent some types of porosity if your main torch shield isn't perfect. But its fundamental job for stainless is stopping that root oxidation. Under bead cracking, that's usually a hydrogen or stress issue, different mechanism. Got it. That distinction between the torch shield and the backing shield is key for materials like stainless. Okay, let's tackle another common headache. Centerline cracks, specifically in submerged arc welds. Ah, yes. Saw cracks. If you see a distinct crack running right down the middle of a sub-arc weld bead, what's usually the underlying reason for that specific type of crack? What's happening metallurgically? This one really shows how the welding parameters, the bead shape they create, and what happens during solidification are all tied together. When you see that clear centerline crack in a saw bead, the number one culprit is almost always the weld bead geometry itself. It's too deep and narrow. Deep and narrow. Okay, that seems like a simple observation, but why does that shape cause a crack right down the middle? It's all about how the weld pool freezes, how it solidifies, and shrinkage. In a deep, narrow weld, the very last bit of metal to solidify is right along that center line. Right in the middle. Yep. And as metal cools and solidifies, it shrinks. It gets smaller. If the bead shape is deep and narrow, there might not be enough liquid metal left nearby to flow in and fill the gap created by that final bit of shrinkage along the center line. This creates pulling forces, tensile stresses, right at that still hot, weak center line. Okay. Plus, things like sulfur and phosphorus impurities in the steel, they tend to get pushed ahead of the solidification front and concentrate right there along that last to free center line. Making it weaker. Exactly. Weakening the grain boundaries. Mm -hmm. So you have this zone under tension, slightly enriched in impurities, still very hot, and it literally tears itself apart as it finishes solidifying. That's solidification cracking or hot cracking. So it's the shape driving the stress. Primarily, yes. While damp flux could cause hydrogen issues, or the wrong wire chemistry could make it more susceptible, the direct cause of that classic centerline crack is usually that deep, narrow profile creating an unfavorable stress state during cooling. It's a real lesson in how bead shape isn't just cosmetic. Absolutely. That connection between the visible shape and the hidden stress is critical. 
Okay, final scenario. Let's think about assessing quality, making decisions about safety. Right, the practical side. We've talked about a few different well defects. If you had to rank them purely in terms of their effect on the long-term performance, the structural integrity, the load-bearing capacity of a weld, which one is the most severe? Which one poses the biggest risk? Hmm. That's a crucial question for any inspector or engineer. Let's say the options are some scattered porosity, definite cracking in the weld area, some surface undercut on a fillet weld, or a lack of fusion defect. Which one is the worst? Hands down, cracking in the weld area, without a doubt. What really stands out is that a crack isn't just a flaw. It's like an active threat. It's a potential failure starting point. That makes it the most dangerous for structural integrity, especially under load. Why is a crack so much worse than, say, a big void from porosity or an area where the weld didn't even fuse properly. They all sound pretty bad. They're all bad. Definitely undesirable. But a crack is in a completely different category because of its geometry. Think about the very tip of a crack. Sharp. Incredibly sharp. Microscopically sharp. And that sharp tip acts as a massive stress concentrator. Even if the overall load on the structure isn't that high, the stress right at that crack tip can be magnified enormously. Okay. This provides a perfect place for failure to start and, crucially, to spread, to propagate. Mm. A crack can grow rapidly, often suddenly, leading to brittle, catastrophic failure with very little warning. It's like that tiny scratch on glass that's where the break starts. Porosity. It reduces the area carrying the load. And the holes can concentrate stress a bit, but generally not nearly as severely as a sharp crack tip, especially if it's scattered. Undercut, that's a notch on the surface. It reduces thickness, concentrates stress, can be bad for fatigue, but again, usually not the same immediate danger as a crack. Lack of fusion, that definitely reduces the load-bearing area, creates a discontinuity, but typically it doesn't have that same ultra-sharp tip that makes a crack so prone to sudden propagation. I see. Because, yeah, crack is the ultimate structural discontinuity. It demands immediate attention. It's the defect that should genuinely keep inspectors and engineers awake at night if it's found. So wrapping this up, what does this all mean for you listening, whether you're learning this stuff out there welding or inspecting, maybe studying for that C-SWEP exam? It seems really clear that true welding expertise isn't just about laying down a nice bead. It's this deeper understanding, isn't it? Understanding the materials, the process, these potential pitfalls we've talked about. Susie. We've seen how vital controlling hydrogen is to stop that sneaky cold cracking. How basic electrode storage is key against porosity. Why argon backing is non-negotiable for protecting stainless. How bead shape itself can cause centerline cracks. Mm -hmm. And finally, why a crack is just fundamentally the most dangerous defect when it comes to carrying load. Understanding the why behind all this. That's what builds confidence and ensures safety. Absolutely. And, you know, diving into these, let's say, fundamental concepts, it kind of raises a bigger question, doesn't it? How so? Well, as the things we build get more complex, as we use new materials, push designs harder, mm -hmm. how does our understanding of these basic behaviors, hydrogen, solidification, oxidation, how does that need to keep evolving too? What new challenges, maybe even more subtle ones, are waiting around the corner for ensuring weld quality in the future? It makes you think. The learning in this field really never stops.